afternoon and welcome to this installment of the Exploring Sustainable Seafood Virtual Panel Series. My name is Kim Thompson. I'm the director of the Aquarium in the Pacific's Seafood for the Future program. For most of us, the term sustainable seafood is linked to issues and concerns such as escapes, bycatch, and overfishing. These are all really important issues, but does this narrow lens through which we currently look at sustainable seafood tell the whole story? Does it allow us to make informed decisions about seafood for the benefit of society and the environment? Today we're gonna to be talking to some experts who will challenge us to look at sustainable seafood through a wider lens. I'm pleased to welcome our panelists, Michael Tlusty from the University of Massachusetts, Boston, Robert Jones from the Nature Conservancy, and Peter Tidmers from Dalhousie University. You can find links to their bios and additional resources from this and other talks in this series at aquariumofpacific.org. Now let's dive in by getting to know a little bit about our panelists. Peter, we're gonna start with you. Can you tell us a little bit about the work that you're doing and is what you're doing now anywhere close to what you thought you were gonna be doing when you first applied to college? Sure, let me start with uh, what I do now. I'm an ecological economist. And the work I'd like to do in that context is using um, material and energy-based tools like energy analysis and life cycle assessment to evaluate human activities through a lens of uh, sort of biophysical sustainability. And most of the work I do, it's not exclusively food-related, but most of the work I do is, is food-related. So understanding, uh, for example, greenhouse gas emissions that result from field crop production or livestock production. But even within the, uh, the whole food space, most of my work historically and continues to be uh, related to um, seafood systems. So both fishing, uh, fisheries and aquaculture. And to your second question, which is this work at all related to what I started out doing? Um, not really. My undergrad was uh, in geology. I went to uh, university originally to become a geologist and uh, didn't proceed beyond my undergraduate degree in geology. And then I did something weird and went to law school um, and ultimately became what I am now. Well, I think that some of our college students who are tuning in are going to be very happy to hear that there are some indirect routes to get to some of these career paths. Robert, how about you? Can you tell us a little bit about the work that you're doing at the Nature Conservancy and is what you're doing now anywhere close to what 18-year-old Robert thought he was gonna be doing when he applied to college? Yeah. Thanks, Kim, and thanks to those of you at home joining us and tuning in. Um, I'm Robert Jones, I'm the Global Lead for Aquaculture at the Nature Conservancy. Uh, the Nature Conservancy is one of the world's largest conservation organizations. We're in 72 countries and we're focused on three main challenges, tackling climate change, ensuring healthy oceans, lands, and fresh water, and providing food and water sustainably. So I run the aquaculture program. We're focused on advancing restorative aquaculture of bivalves and seaweed, and ensuring smart growth of fin fish systems around the world. We have projects in seven countries. Um, I guess I'm kind of lucky in that I've used both of my degrees. My undergraduate degree, I went to Boston College and studied international relations. I had dreams of working for uh, the State Department on en environmental issues um, and wrote a senior thesis on managing uh, fish stocks between U.S. and Canada and, and um, how salmon is managed. Um, I, I soon developed a passion for aquaculture and got an aquaculture degree at University of Miami. So I guess I used both of my degrees in my job doing aquaculture work and international work. Um, so it kind of the plan kind of worked out. But um, so, yeah. Nice to be here. Thanks, Kim. Great. So is there a rivalry between Boston University and University of Massachusetts? <laughs> Boston College, first of oh, all. Oh, Boston yeah. College, sorry. Yes. College. <laughs> it's definitely a CCBU rivalry. Yeah. All right, so this should be fun. So let's go to the University of Massachusetts, Boston. Uh, Michael, can you tell us a little bit about the work that you're doing there and tell us if it's if what you're doing now is anywhere close to what you thought you were gonna be doing when you graduated from college? Sure, thanks Kim for having us. Um, these, this is a, a great webinar series and um, I look forward to seeing all of them. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm an, 
Associate Professor of Sustainability and Food Solutions at University of Massachusetts, Boston. Um, and I just, I work in seafood. Um, a lot of what I do is mentor students on projects they're interested in. So I currently have a student from um, Nigeria who's a catfish farmer and interested in processing catfish. Um, I have another student who just started interested in oysters and, and looking at growth of that. Um, and really it's, it's how can we have, you know, my, a lot of my work is how can we help aquaculture do a better job. So um, I have some job, I have some current grants building sensors, monitoring for diseases, moder moder monitoring for gear integrity. Um, and really what I like to do is bring disparate people into a room and figure out how we can all work together um, to, to create solutions. Um, yeah, I never thought I would be in aquaculture. Um, when I went to school, I wanted to be a zoo nutritionist. And so I went to the University of Illinois and I studied animal science. Um, and so a lot of that is, um, I use all of that knowledge still today, except I never learned anything about fish. Um, University of Illinois is a terrestrial ag school. Um, but then I went to uh, graduate school at Syracuse University and I studied spacing systems and animals. And then I got a job monitor, um, trying to determine carrying capacity of salmon farming. And really it's agriculture and it's talking about animal spacing. So I kind of used everything to do that. Um, and then uh, after I left Canada, I came back to the US and I did work in a public aquarium and I was doing lobster nutrition. So I eventually did become a, uh, a wild animal nutritionalist, um, just like I like just like I wanted to. Um, and then um, moved over to UMass where we could work on bigger food system issues. Great, and we should also mention that Sean McNally, who is on our regulatory panel, is one of your students at the University of yes, Massachusetts. Yes. It's yes, one big is. happy family. <laughs> <laughs> so now I wanna talk a little bit about a project. Michael and Peter, you both worked on a paper with a number of different researchers around the world called Reframing the Sustainable Seafood Narrative. So Michael, can you tell us what is the current na narrative for sustainable seafood and why does it need to be reframed? Well, a lot of the work um, that we've spent the last two decades doing has really been improving aquaculture units, farms, um, in increasing fisheries so stocks are healthy. But when we message that, it's really coming through sustainable seafood for healthy oceans. And what I've noticed is as you start talking to the agriculture sector and you know the, the beef, pork, and chicken farmers, a lot of them believe they're dealing with global problems of hunger and they're feeding the world. And they will look at you and they'll say, well, you're dealing with seafood, so you go make the oceans healthy and that's nice and we're gonna go solve these real problems. And that's just not really what's happening in seafood. You know, a billion people around the world depend on seafood as their primary protein source. Um, it's an environmentally friendly um, source of, of protein. It's nutritionally important. There's all these benefits. And so we're almost doing a job of underselling it as saying, well, if you eat this fish because it's from a well-managed stock, the ocean's going to be healthy. There's so much wrapped up in ocean health. There's temperature, there's acidification, there's pollution, there's noise pollution, plastics. There's so many things that we actually can't touch and we do have to. Um, so for ocean health, we need to have a much more holistic view of ocean health, but at the same time, we need to integrate seafood into a food system, not just a healthy ocean system. So uh, Peter, you were also a co-author on this paper. So do you have anything to add to that? Sure. Um, it, picking up first on some of what Michael was just saying, I think there is, um, it's very easy for a lot of our colleagues in other disciplines uh, working on food systems to either just overlook seafood and the role that seafood can play. And so I just wanted to maybe reinforce that uh, point that Michael was making that if we don't find ways to talk about seafood and analyze seafood in ways that are broadly consistent with and comparable to 
larger food systems, it's easy for seafood to then be marginalized and overlooked and not realize the great potential that it has. But at the same time, we have, by, you know, the focus that we've had to date within seafood tends to um, lead to non, uh, non well, less useful differentiation within. So we often will see conflicts and arguments between, for example, aquaculture and fisheries, or different forms of aquaculture as somehow being superior or inferior based on very narrow sort of attributes and not appreciating the, the, the I guess, the greater nuance and richness that exists. And sometimes the similarities that exist between forms that may be traditionally at odds with each other. So I think, I think there's a, uh, the, work that we did, and uh, full credit to Michael for seeing this opportunity to try to pose this larger question and challenge of how do we um, confront the historical sort of bias um, and, um, and focus of a lot of the sustainable seafood narrative and try to broaden it. But in doing so, he really invited a lot of people into that author tent. And um, it was a, an interesting and, and at times difficult process to really accommodate a lot of different uh, positions. But I think it, it has been valuable for all of us involved, but I hope it has value outside of um, at least our author group and how we collect I think more effectively and completely about seafood and sustainability. So <clears throat> it sounds like one of the reasons that the, well, a, a big, many reasons that the current narrative needs to be reframed is that in order to really look at ocean health more holistically and to look at how we can maximize the benefits that seafood can provide to the environment and society, we really need to take a step back and look at it through the lens of a food, of as part of a food system. And then Peter, you would also mention that we also need to be careful with if and how we differentiate. And I think you guys are going to talk a little bit more later about you know, the diversity of seafood options that we have. And while we need to understand that, we also need to be um, cautious in how we're taking these pieces apart. Did I, did I capture that correctly? Yeah. And I think this goes back to something Michael actually said in his introduction was that power and importance of collaborative efforts to come to solutions. So you mentioned that you had a lot of diverse voices that came together to help author this paper. Um, so is that also an, an accurate assessment of kind of one of the mechanisms that we need to move this conversation forward in a more productive way. Yeah, there's so much there's so much good yeah. <laughs> there's so much good work being done. It's 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 awe-inspiring just to sit there and keep seeing these papers come out. Um, but then the question is how can we get the industry to pay attention and start to make these these changes on the ground? You know, one of the things I think about is when we're when so many people want to sell sustainable seafood, are, is that overpromising again, a healthy ocean? And when we start doing things like substituting fish species and then you get a $5 grouper sandwich, does that signal to the consumer that grouper is cheap and abundant and therefore we don't have to worry about it when actually the industry is playing games and, and mislabeling? You know, we really need to be honest and say, Wow, grouper, you know, a, a true grouper sandwich is going to be super expensive because it's it's a hard to find fish. Um, and then yet that sends the proper signal to the consumer that not everything is is per, you know is going well in the oceans. But I, I think it's interesting. So you did just mention then the role that the industry needs to play in you know catching on to this and taking action. But what about the role that the environmental community needs to play in this? So we also have a role in in putting out this narrative about what sustainable seafood is. Um, so so what is our role in the environmental community in in expanding this narrative? Yeah, I think we need to do a better job in the environmental community to be true to the science about aquaculture and what it shows and that it can be a great opportunity for the environment when it's when it's done well. Um, if we're looking about at resource efficiency compared to our alternatives, aquaculture stacks up pretty well. The, the ways of managing aquaculture are getting stronger and we know how to manage some of these environmental impacts. Um, there's a lot more work that needs to be done, but 
you know, what Michael and Peter's report do does well, I think is helps us in that framing and understanding um, aquaculture and seafood in this broader sense and how it stacks up um, compared to the alternatives in a broader food system. I'm a bit optimistic of where I think the narr global narrative is headed and uh, identifying aquaculture as a potential opportunity. Um, there's, there's three big papers that came to mind from, from groups that are traditionally kind of outside the aquaculture or the seafood space. The Food and Land Use Coalition report, 10 Critical Transitions report, it's, it's, a, it's a great report. A lot of folks in the ag community are looking at that. Identifying aquaculture as one of those 10 key transitions to make our food system sustainable going forward and meet uh, human nutritional needs. The Eat Landsat Commission report as well, identifying fisheries and aquaculture as the one area of, of protein North Americans could, should eat more of. I think that's important, um, groups like that being involved. And the high level panel uh, report on the blue economy recently identified aquaculture uh, and investments in fisheries is having the best o ROI of any intervention in the ocean space or among the best ROIs of any interventions in the ocean space um, from an environmental and a social perspective. So these, I think the narrative is moving in the right direction, but, but a lot more uh, needs to be done. So just yeah, to that clarify, HP, uh, that, that, oh, go ahead, Kim. sorry, just to clarify, ROI is return on investment, correct? Yeah. Thank you. Michael, yes. sorry, go ahead. And that high level panel, um, the Costello et al. report that just came out, you know, they've identified um, we can get six times more food out of the oceans than we're currently doing. So again, it's not only a good return on investment, it's actually in terms of more people, you know, if we put 10 billion people on the planet by 2050, that's 20% more people, which you need almost twice the amount of food. So we're gonna need 50 to 60% more food. Where is that coming from? This is where seafood really has an opportunity to, to fill that niche. So it does sound like there are some high level actors that are starting to really look at seafood in the context of the food supply. Um, <laughs> so, so as part of that though, that, that's only kind of one piece that your paper really tackled and one piece of integrating seafood into the food supply. So I wanna start getting a little bit deeper into these issues and Peter, we're gonna start with you on this. Can you talk to us a little bit about the role that seafood might be playing in terms of helping to address some of the climate change challenges that we're facing? Sure. And we touch on it in the paper, but it's really, I think uh, the evidence for this is present in a lot of other sources, some of which you know we cite in the paper. So we haven't done a lot of any new analysis per se in, in the paper that Michael led, but I think it's very clear that when we look across sources of animal protein in particular, so this is the big three livestock systems, beef, pork, and chicken, and we look at seafood systems, and there we have to first acknowledge that those seafood systems are incredibly diverse not only aquaculture fisheries, but we have a lot of different um, activities that are embedded within both of them. We, when you look across those, what you realize from a, through the lens of greenhouse gas emissions is that many seafood systems, and I would say the vast majority of seafood that is produced and available to the world up to the point of the dock has often much, much lower greenhouse gas emissions than the terrestrial alternatives, and in particular, beef, and to a lesser extent, pork, chicken, up to the point of production is, you know, on average, chicken's greenhouse gas emissions is probably similar to a global average seafood that is produced. But um, the, there are huge benefits here of genuine sort of protein shifting. So if we are able to produce more seafood effectively at similar levels of uh, you know, current greenhouse gas emissions, and we do a better job, and this comes back to a point that we were touching on a moment ago about, you know, Michael, you said how much we had to expand food provisioning. I would test, I would, I would challenge that a little bit because we have an enormous amount of material now, particularly animal proteins that could be shared better, shared more effectively mm -hmm. um, between people to meet more people's biological needs with what we've got available. But um, if we do a better job of producing seafood 
in similar ways, and we substitute seafood for those higher impact sources of animal protein, beef in particular, we can move a tremendous distance towards lowering food related greenhouse gas emissions without giving up animal proteins in our diet. You know, this is not about suddenly North America and Northern Europe becoming all uh, vegetarian. We can achieve, I think, enormous improvements in overall diet related emissions while retaining engagement in eating of animal proteins by just um, engaging in some of that strategic um, greenhouse gas emission, you know, sort of virtuous greenhouse gas emission product shipping. So I, I want to kind of uh, touch on that kind of that last point that you made that, you know, by substituting less efficient sources of meat with more efficient sources of meat that could help with our efforts to adapt to and mitigate climate change. So one of the issues with marine aquaculture that we face right now is this debate with shellfish and seaweed versus finfish. And oftentimes what's lost in this conversation is kind of what you just said is that, you know, we, we do have, especially in the U.S. and Canada, we love our meat. And the question is, can shellfish and seaweed play that role as a substitute or does finfish really have to play some of that role in terms of shifting diets? to a more climate-friendly diet? Finfish, cultured finfish, and many sources of wild-caught finfish, even though the, our ability to expand those opportunities is, is very limited on the, on the fishery side, but they represent um, really, in many instances, far, far lower greenhouse gas emission sources of protein I keep on comparing it to beef, but it's not because beef is one of the highest sources of impact, but because beef is so dominant in North American diets. Let me just put this into context. Um, it's been a couple of years since I looked at these numbers, but if you took all the seafood consumed in the US per person, it is outweighed by the um, per person consumption of beef three and a half to one. So, the scale of opportunity for center of plate substitution is really large when you're talking about beef. And yes, some of our lowest emitting sources of greenhouse gases may be associated with bivalves per unit of protein produced, but there are lots of forms of finfish production that are also really high performance relative to what, the, what that thing is that you're substituting for, which is in the, in the vast majority of people's plates, it's going to be beef. So it sounds like in addition to what we know on paper and what you guys are researching, we also have to factor in human behavior. And because humans like beef, then that substitution with that meat protein for fish, which can also be very efficient, is going to be a really important piece. Yeah. So yeah, I, go ahead, Mike. Go ahead. I just add, I think, you know, what people choose to eat is a, a deeply personal choice. It's a, it's a cultural choice. Um, you know, we encourage people to have an understanding of the environmental impacts of their food and make their, their own choices. But, you know, we, we recognize that each of these segments, beef, poultry, aquaculture, fin fish will be a part of our food system. And each sector has an obligation to improve. Like TNC is working with cattle ranchers to help improve their practices. We're working with row croppers, just like we're working with the fishery sector and, and the aquaculture sector. Um, you know, I think um, that aquaculture creates a, a, a big opportunity and in our space, you know, certainly fin fish are going to be there. So we need to figure out how to make those production systems sustainable. Uh, bivalves hopefully can be a bigger part of the, the food system and so can seaweed. Um, and hopefully consumer demand reflects that as well. But we need to be working on thin fish. So Robert, sticking with you. Um, so adding to the discussion about climate change, the Nature Conservancy, as you have alluded to already, has been doing some really great work in the area of aquaculture and climate change. So can you elaborate a little bit more about what you guys are doing um, and why you're spending the time and effort to look at aquaculture as a tool to help adapt and mitigate climate change? Yeah, so you know, climate change is a top priority issue for 
uh, the Nature Conservancy. This is really the environmental issue of our generation. It touches everyone and it touches every issue we're working on at TNC. And there's really strong linkages to food systems here, obviously, agriculture and food production accounting for uh, over 10% of greenhouse gas emissions. We need to make sure our food system is using uh, or emitting carbon efficiently. We need to reduce that. We need to make sure our food systems are resilient so they continue, continue to produce food for future generations, nutritious food for future generations. Um, I think aquaculture is really strongly linked to this climate narrative in really three main ways, uh, adaptation, resilience, and mitigation. On the adaptation point, we need to adapt our food system to reflect lower carbon emissions. This is the point Peter brought up, order of magnitude potentially less, or in the case of bivalves and seaweed, even less than that, uh, carbon emissions compared to uh, beef, for example. So there's, there's an opportunity there. So there's just this angle of aquaculture needs to be a greater share, or at least the lower uh, emitting forms of it, a greater share of our food production system. Um, resilience, you know, I think we need to diversify our food production system and anticipate those impacts of climate change occurring. Aquaculture responds differently than fisheries, uh, responds differently than terrestrial food production. So integrating uh, and advancing aquaculture in strategic ways and locations can help uh, food continue to be produced in a sustainable way and bring those benefits uh, to people and communities. And then mitigation and sequestration, this third area, um, we're very interested in some of the emerging research around um, seaweeds and the potential of seaweeds to be a tool for climate, uh, uh, for climate um, sequestration or mitigation. I think the science is early in that space yet, but there's some studies looking at ocean acidification buffering potential and whether large scale open ocean seaweed aquaculture could have sequestration benefits or uses as biofuels um, and in bovine feeds. So that's all very exciting to us. So we're doing a lot of work on synthesis science. We have a number of evaluations that are uh, looking to advance uh, and help us understand aquaculture's role um, in our food system affected by climate change. And on the ground, we're doing so as well. So in places like Belize and Palau, we're working on introducing sustainable forms of aquaculture into communities as fish stocks become less reliable and sustainable for those communities. Um, this is a way of building resiliency into those communities as climate change effects become more apparent. So one of the things that you had mentioned when you were explaining all this great work that you guys are doing is uh, having access to more nutritious food. And so, Michael, I'm going to turn to you. And so, you know, one of the key themes that you do bring out in your paper is also the role that seafood plays in human health and nutrition. So can you walk us through why that's important in terms of sustainable seafood? Why should the environmental community care that this is a nutritious source of food? Right. In a lot of the paper, the issues we talk about taking, you know, the, the discussion of um, seafood and sustainable seafood from a single focus issue to a holistic integrated series of, of issues or taking it from ocean health to taking it into a food system context are really broadening the discussion of seafood. But when you start talking about seafood itself, you know, Peter has alluded to many species, many production systems, different impacts associated with each of those. And so this is one of the, the points where, and you know, I always chuckle because here I am talking about seafood, yet at the same time, we need to be very specific about the types of seafood we're talking about. So when we talk about one of the benefits nutritionally of eating seafood, it's really the long chain omega-3 fatty acids and particular, particularly um, EPA and DHA. These are the long chain omega-3 fatty acids. They're really um, primarily available through marine food systems. And these are things that get bioaccumulated up the food system. So algaes produce them and then the detritivores eat the algae and it slowly builds up. Um, and so, uh, so see, there are some species that are much better sources of these long chain omega-3 fatty acids. So Salmon, for example, is, is one of the highest levels of um, EPA and DHA of the classically known seafood species. So in the US, when we eat seafood, and again, I'm using that general term, 
the primary, the primary, you know, almost 25% of that is shrimp. And shrimp is not a great source for these long chain omega-3 fatty acids, um, where salmon is. And salmon's the second most consumed species that, that we have. And then there's tuna, pollock, tilapia, cod, and all of the white fish tend to be less available. So there's a couple things going on nutritionally. The Food and Drug Administration and the dietary guidelines suggest we eat eight ounces of seafood a week. That's 26 pounds a year. Currently, we're only at about 16 pounds. So we're not even eating what the government suggests we're eating. If the benefit of eating this seafood is these long chain omega-3 fatty acids, the, the dietary recommendation in the US is 250 milligrams of long chain omega-3 fatty acids. And in that 16 pounds of seafood, we're only getting about 38% of that 250 because we're eating more low omega-3 species than, than not. So we, we do need to do some, some readjustment of, um, you know, eat, this is why eating more seafood is good because we would get more omega-3 fatty acids. But again, eating oysters are a good omega-3 source, seaweed's a good omega-3 source. And so just changing the, the portfolio of, of what we're actually eating, incorporating more small oily fish, sardines, mackerels, menhaden, if we could get more of those into our diet, that would that would be a, a really a really big boon to our nutrition. I'm glad you mentioned seaweed. So for our vegan and vegetarian friends out there, you still have seafood options that are very good for you. <laughs> Um, so, so Peter, I want to ask you, so uh, Michael just walked us through the important nutrient profile, particularly the long chain omega-3 fatty acids that seafood can provide to society. Um, but I wanted you to touch a little bit upon then, you know, how we should be looking at in terms of, you know, as you guys mentioned, there's a di diverse portfolio in terms of the types of species, how we produce them, whether it be on farm or wild capture, the different types of farms. How should we be also be then looking at doing that in the context of the nutritional value that that seafood has. Yeah. It, it, so the, what I would maybe build on what Michael was saying is there's no question those long chain omega-3 fatty acids are really important. And, and seafood sources are some of our relatively fewer sources of those uh, nutrients, which are important in human diets, but it's not the full story of what seafood can do for us. I'm just looking at a graphic from another paper that's currently under review. And depending on the, on the seafood source, it, it can be a surprisingly important source of vitamins B12, B6, vitamin D, even copper. So there, you know, there's a lot of other smaller, sort of more uh, micronutrient attributes of a lot of different um, that are sourced from seafood systems very differently. Um, then uh, there are a lot of different uh, sources of these micronutrients from different seafood systems that are really important in human diets. And it's not just the diets that we get to enjoy here, but it's diets that other people whose access to a broader suite of, of food options is more limited. So, you know, aquaculture, you, you can't just be thinking about what aquaculture and fisheries can do for us in well-fed, potentially over-nutrified um, North America and Northern Europe. We have to also be thinking about what aquaculture is able to do to fulfill a lot of really critical micronutrient gaps in diets around the world. So I think it's, it's, yeah, diversifying the sort of seafood we take in will balance out the sort of nutrients that we're able to deliver to humans regardless of where we are, but we need to really attend to broader needs than just our own. I, I wanna do a shout out to a paper Peter was on with Eleanor Hallstrom, and they actually looked at nutrient density. So they kind of summed over a, a variety of nutrients um, the, the vitamins, the selenium, um, along with the omega-3. And, and then they actually compared that to greenhouse gas um, emissions. And so again, it was this really nice plot showing nutrient density, environmental impacts, um, 
And so that that was a great paper. And if there's if we can get a link to that in um, in the show notes, that would that would be great. The other thing is, um, you know, one one note about seafood is that there have been a few studies that have looked. You know, it's like, well, why don't we just reduce everything down to an omega three pill and take that? Well, there are some studies saying, you know implicating that eating whole seafood is actually better than reducing it down to its components and taking it in individually. So that's something we really do need to be aware of is that we're talking about nutrients here, but fish provide a sum package, which is actually really good. Um, and it's, it can't be equated to just reducing everything down to nutrients and just taking an equal complement of nutrients. So, Seafood is a very important source of multiple nutrients, including long chain omega-3 fatty acids. Um, but as Peter was saying then, it's also important then to weigh both those environmental impacts and benefits with that nutrient profile of the individual species as we determine how we evaluate and weigh these things in terms of what is sustainable and what isn't sustainable. Correct? Mm -hmm. yep. So... Michael, I want to turn to you then on, on another, this is what you get from being the lead author on the paper. <laughs> Where another point that you make um, on the paper, which is that we need to stop focusing just on the fishermen and farms and that we need to take a step back and look at the seafood industry as a whole. So can you tell us a little bit more about the role that the seafood industry plays, what that looks like and why it's important for sustainable seafood? Yeah. You know, a lot of the effort um, has been around getting certifications and ranking, rankings, making sure farms and, and fisheries are all operating up to some standard level of, of performance. And really what that's doing is that's kind of, that's colonialism. We're just basically taking our values and saying, you must do that and give it to us. Okay, so that's fine, but then Let's say we take that seafood, we buy it, you know, I go home, I buy it, I don't use it and I throw it out. It doesn't matter how sustainable it is. If I'm throwing it out, all that work and all that embodied energy in that product has gone to waste. And really, we only can make more and do a better job making more with the fishermen and the fisheries. But once that product is made, it's really up to the value chain to value it. You know, it's, it is a value chain. So let's value those products. Let's not have loss and waste. Um, let's, you know, and seafood is one of the higher waste food issues. You know, every, um, you know, there's reports from the World Resource Institute. If you look at food waste as its own greenhouse gas emitter, it would be just behind the US, China and India as the largest greenhouse gas emissions category. Um, you know, Peter had a, little pushback to me when I said, you know, we're going to put 28% more people on, we need more food. The reason you need more food is because we're so wasteful. You almost need twice the amount of food to feed the number of people because we're just dumping so much of it. So we need to stop that. One thing as consumers we can do is we cannot overconsume. You know, if um, Peter and I wrote a, a blog for Triple Pundit years ago called Pissing Away Sustainability, and it's if you overconsume protein, your body digests it, it doesn't store it, it gets excreted as urea, which is what our urine is. So if you eat too much seafood, it goes to waste. If you eat too much beef, it goes to waste. You know, So having appropriate sized meals is actually one of the, you don't need to stop eating things, you just need to cut back a little bit. You know, Be a little more plant forward in your meals. The, the proteins that we don't store we need a, we need the value, um, but then you know the same thing goes for you know um, grocery stores like the fresh case. Stop throwing stuff away out of your fresh case. Uh, you know Peter had a, a graduate student who did some work, and again there is a lot of variation in how much waste is actually getting tossed out of the fresh case. Um, and it, it varies by species. Whole fish tend to get dumped faster than, than fillets. And, you know, it, it, it was, there, were, there was a lot of variation in it. But we can't have sustainable food if we're just throwing it away and, and not valuing it. So that's really where the industry comes into play is, you know, and I know the industry would agree and say, 
wow, every piece we throw away, that's money we're losing. Yeah, but we're still doing it a lot and we need to stop that. So it, it sounds like then we need to stop just focusing on the, the beginning producer, the fishermen, the farmers, and we need to also stop focusing just on the consumers and we need to look at the supply chain as a whole. And you just gave the example, the very important example of food waste as being one of those mechanisms that it needs to stop on the farm, but it also needs to stop with the processors, with the distributors, at the retail level, as well as the consumer. Right. Yes. And Robert, did you have anything to add to that discussion about looking at the whole supply chain in terms of sustainable seafood? Yeah. Um, you know, certainly I think, you know, the producers have a responsibility here, you know, some of the origins of these certification schemes, such as the GAA and the Global Aquaculture Alliance came because industry had a recognition that there was a problem and they needed to solve it. Um, there's certainly a lot more um, work that needs to be done, but there's, it's also useful to look at who else has influence on this sector and specifically around aquaculture. And there's two for me that, that stand out um, where, you know, that need to be making responsible decisions going forward. One are the investors uh, those that will be investing into the aquaculture space going forward. Uh, we wrote a report recently on uh, impact investing in the aquaculture space. We projected that there's going to be $150 billion to $300 billion of capital investment made in infrastructure alone in the aquaculture space in the next 10 years. Um, th this is an industry that's really doubling in size uh, in that 10 to 15 year period of time. So there those groups and those investment decisions that they make, whether they're institutional investors, family offices, um, you know, private equity firms or venture capitalists, the decisions they make are going to be really important in shaping how this industry comes into play. That capital is leverage over how this industry develops. You know, we're very interested in working with that investor community to make sure that, you know, those decisions are made uh, smartly. Um, the other group is governance. Um, that's really important for the aquaculture sector and the regulations and policy around aquaculture determine whether that industry is going to have a significant or less significant environmental impact or whether that industry can take on a growth trajectory uh, or not. You know, there are some countries that have really good tools for managing their aquaculture industry and fisheries industry. There's others that do not and need to step up. So, um, uh, you know, there needs to be efforts to bring the, the uh, tools and technologies from around the world to those places. There needs to be more investment into the R&D um, and, and policy uh, and management schemes that are being developed around the world. Yeah, and, and I think that's a great point. When we were mentioning the seafood supply chain earlier, it clearly is much bigger than what we typically think of just with where the seafood goes. It's also, as you mentioned, those investors and then the government's role and even the NGO role. Um, we all have a role to play in this uh, supply chain. So Robert, I wanna stick with you. Um, so I wanna kind of switch gears a little bit and talk about a major perception with sustainability tends to be that if it's a smaller scale, it's sustainable. If it's a larger industrial scale uh, operation, then it's not sustainable. Is this an accurate depiction of what sustainable seafood is? And if not, how should we be looking at these different scales and these different models in terms of sustainable seafood? Yeah, I think this is like a great philosophical debate that it goes beyond aquaculture and is part of, you know, a traditional agriculture debate and, and um, um, different perspectives on development as it occurs in different countries. I mean, a lot of the work that we do at TNC is focused on small scale shellfish and seaweed aquaculture, working with communities. And that's great. There's a reason why, you know, those uh, shellfish and seaweed uh, work in those contexts. They're relatively low tech. Um, they can be deployed in those those communities and, and be effective. Um, but there's also a rationale um, that higher intensity, high tech, precision aquaculture is, impo is important um, and can reap sustainability benefits over the way aquaculture is currently practiced. This is the reason why we support um, 
we're circulating aquaculture technologies. We support the transition to offshore aquaculture. Those types of technologies allow for the control of, of uh, outputs and the monitoring and control of environmental impacts. Um, so that high tech um, type of aquaculture, which is often associated with, with large scale, larger scale farms, um, can result in those sustainability gains that, that we think are, are important. And, and Peter, did you have something to add to that? Well, about scale? and I just, um, yeah, it, it's not just a question of aquaculture, but it, it, this is one that comes up in fisheries a great deal as well. And I think there is a, uh, there, are, there are a lot of very traditional sort of constructions of what is virtuous that tends to land on the small as opposed to the larger, but there are great um, high performing, when I say high performing, you know, uh, adhering to all governance requirements and having, for example, really low greenhouse gas emissions coming back to that point, there are a lot of really high performance, large volume, large boat fisheries. One of the, you know, largest fisheries, I think it still is the largest fishery perhaps in the United States, um, you know, the Alaska Pollock fishery, people will take issue with it in other ways, but it is a generally a big boat fishery, large volume fishery that is by many measures, very high performance. And so we, we I think do a disservice to um, the challenges that we are trying to overcome if we default to really simple um, answers that may not actually be anchored in any kind of um, observable reality. We need to understand systems, we need to understand what we're trying to achieve, we need to be able to measure against those achievements and recognize virtue regardless of where they occur, large or small. I would argue that it's, it's really what's your core basis of definition for sustainability. So if we're talking about greenhouse gas emissions, the high performance pollock fishery um, Peter's referring to is energy efficient because you're catching a massive amount of fish with a single boat trip. It's a big boat, but you know, a massive amount of fish. Um, and really it's, again, this return on investment, how much energy is being used to catch how much energy from the ocean. You contrast that to, you know, I'm in New England, we love our lobster. The lobster fishery is great, but these are small boats going out, fishing all day, catching only, couple hundred pounds, you know, the energy of the lobster fishery, the energy investment is much, much greater. It's also using a bait. So you have to account for all the energy that goes into the bait. So when you start looking at that, it's a real small boat, single boat owner, you know, owner operator fishery. But from a greenhouse gas perspective, it's, it's really not great. Um, but again, the American lobster fishery is MSC certified, but MSC doesn't account for greenhouse gases in, in their thing. So it's really what's your sweet spot of sustainability and what are the factors you're looking at? If we're really talking about carbon emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, you know, the move towards recirculation aquaculture is using a lot of pumps, it's using a lot of electricity. Potentially what we're doing is we're saying, oh, we're getting rid of this one negative impact that we don't like from net pens and you're not really looking at the suite of you know what are you jumping into what are the unintended consequences of this decision to take something out of out of the ocean and put it on the land uh so just to clarify msc is marine stewardship council, stewardship council. certification yes, yes, yes. um Thank and you. that's a wild capture fishery certification um so so it sounds like this is very complex right um which actually brings me to our next question. Um, and this is for all of you, but Michael, we'll start with you since you started with this, which is, you know, clearly we do need to better understand what these issues are, both those localized issues that we're all familiar with, like bycatch, overfishing, escapes, but we also then need to be able to take a step back and look at it in the broader context of food, nutrition, how it can be a tool to help with adaptation and mitigation to climate change. So, but th this is complicated. You've, you've already kind of mentioned this. So how do we reconcile this? How do we weigh these uh, impacts and these benefits at these different levels? So I think one thing we have to um, 
we have to get it, get away from is the mindset that you know there's a there's a this is this is not a silver bullet solution you know there's not one thing we can do to make everything right there's just so many things going on um, you know it's it's really it's a it's an integrated wicked problem of and that so and wicked problems mean we need to have lots of little solutions being co-managed simultaneously working towards a greater sum. So, you know, the one thing we can do is we can stop saying seafood sustainable because number one, you can take anything, you know, give me a seafood that somebody says is sustainable and we'll figure out 10 ways we can improve it. So, but once you call something sustainable, there's kind of that reluctance to say, well, let's improve it. It's sustainable. Why should we improve it? No, it's, you need to keep increasing sustainability of, of everything, depending if you think it's good, improve it. If you think it's bad, improve it. You know, we, we need this continual improvement. So we need to change our mindset. We can't have programs selling 100% sustainable seafood for that very same reason. There's nothing wrong with saying, we're gonna have a guided tier and we're gonna look to increase you know, our sales in this and slowly bring things on. So. You know, I've I've often um, likened the the journey towards sustainability of trying to cross a long river. You can't just jump over it in a single step. You have to go through stepping stones, and you kind of have to very de deliberately take steps to advance to get to the other side. And in the terms of seafood, the other side is far, far away. So we have to keep moving towards it and talk about increasing sustainability as opposed to being sustainable. So in a nutshell, sustainability is a journey. It is a journey, <laughs> yes. Robert, how about you? What would you say that needs to happen in order to rectify this balance between those kind of local potential impacts to ecosystems versus this bigger food systems, climate change lens for sustainable seafood? Well, you know, I think we there needs to be greater recognition of aquaculture and fisheries role in our food system. Um, we need to put the dollars towards um, rebuilding fisheries. We need to put the dollars towards advancing um, sustainable aquaculture development. Um, at the same time, we can't forget about the environmental issues that are associated with the industry. So we have to continue to make progress. I totally agree with Michael. So yes, it's more sustainable aquaculture, more aquaculture, but we need to continue to address those issues and make progress on them. And I think we do that by investing both in the science and the companies that are developing the needed tools and technologies to address those key issues, uh, the feed sustainability, um, the escape and genetic issues, the effluent issues, and all and all of those. Um, so that you know, that would that would be where I'd say we need to focus. So we need to invest more in, a in the development and expansion of sustainable marine aquaculture, but then also in our understanding of those systems and how they interact with the environment through investment in science. Science and the companies that are going to develop those technologies as well. So. It's academic groups, um, it's government research, it's um, new startup companies. There's a lot of things to be excited about that in the aquaculture space. Great, so once again, we're talking about multi-stakeholder collaboration to move these solutions forward. So Peter, how about you? Uh, what is it that we need to do to reconcile these issues of these impacts that are more localized, but then also these kind of bigger lens issues like seafood in the food system, climate change, nutrition. What is it that needs to happen? So I, I think my colleagues have, you know, addressed some really good practical um, or philosophical approaches. What I would add though, is that we need to cut each other a bit of slack as well, because there is no one um, uh, perfect way of prioritizing across all of the the concerns that we have about our impacts or our, the impacts that result from fisheries and aquaculture. Some people will value, will place greater emphasis on, let's say, localized environmental destruction that results from a fishery or an aquaculture system. And they'll say, you know what, 
climate change is out there. I am concerned about it, but I'm really, what I prioritize is what I see going on on the water. And that is a completely, and a, for that individual, that's a completely appropriate and defensible emphasis to place, and that will inform their choices. We, I think, don't recognize that we all come into this space with um, passion and, and um, energy to affect positive change, but the, we, I think, make a mistake when we try to impose the value sets that we individually hold or institutionally hold on others, because that's where we start getting into these really problematic debates. It's, oh, I'm sustainable and you're not. No, no, I'm sustainable and you're not. When we fundamentally are, at that point, disagreeing about what we're prioritizing. It's, yeah, we will, we will ultimately land on slightly different um, uh, constructions of, in the moment, what we think we need to address first, and then try to pursue the, you know, and, and it doesn't take anything away from what Michael and Robert have both suggested that we need to do. Um, so it sounds like we really need to work on our political discourse and our ability to come together <laughs> Um, and to understand that we're all in this together and we're all working toward those shared end goals, uh, but we may not always agree on how to get there. All right, so now I need to ask you guys the you burning question. Um, and Robert, we're gonna start with you on this one. Okay. Can we develop a environmentally and economically sustainable marine aquaculture in countries like the US and Canada? And can we do it now? Yes. I mean, I think in some ways we already have an aquaculture industry in both of those countries. Um, are we at the potential where we could be? No. But there is a robust uh, shellfish industry in the United States, um, and there's potential for it to grow. Seaweed is at an early stage. There's some movement around offshore that gets positive. Um, so my answer is absolutely yes. And Peter, how about you? Can we develop a marine aquaculture sector that is both e environmentally and economically sustainable? And can we do it now? Uh, I have to echo, echo Robert. I mean, yeah. given the diversity of ways of which that are valid ways of understanding sustainability, I think there are many good examples on the water and on the land now that do that. Can we make them better? Absolutely. We have to continue to affect positive change in these areas, but we should not, I think, turn our backs on the excellence that is out there now and that can be built upon if we are willing to see more. One of our big challenges um, probably differs a little bit Canada to the US. I think we're a little bit more open to seeing some forms of aquaculture expand here more easily than in the United States. but. Um, no, I think a lot of forms that we have now um, have real opportunity. Um, doesn't mean that they can't still improve. Michael, yeah. can we develop a marine aquaculture sector in countries like the US and Canada that is both environmentally and economically sustainable? And can we do it now? I think we can, um, like both Robert and Peter have said, you know, there are already are those actors that are doing it and showing the way forward. Um, I think one super critical aspect we do need to address is the social license, because it doesn't matter how economically and environmentally sustainable it is, if people don't want it, it's not going to happen. And, um, you know, again, with growing up in Illinois, a background in agriculture, you look at what's going on with farmland and then, you know, we need even a smaller area in the ocean and yet people just are so reticent of it. And I don't know why we're so accepting of, of agriculture and yet we're so dismissive of aquaculture as, you know, largely as a society. Um, you know, there was just a, uh, a public comment period on a proposed Gulf of Mexico um, aquaculture installation. And they had something on the order of 45,000 plus comments. Um, that's, that's a huge hurdle to overcome. At the same time, the one thing I will say is 
uh, economically and environmentally sustainable, yes, but we really got to just not stop making mistakes. Every time an operator loses fish out of a cage, it just, it, it sullies the entire industry. Um, you know, we really, everybody says they can do a good job. We really need them to do a good job and we need to hold, hold their feet to the fire to make sure they're really doing the best job they actually can do. But, but to clarify what you're talking about there, and, and social license, by the way, is super important, and we do have a panel for that, so please tune into that. Um, but as you're mentioning, there's a difference, though, between our scientific knowledge and our technology and having the ability to do it and an actor acting irresponsibly or just maybe having an accident or an incident happen. Is that correct? Right, right. There's a difference between those yeah, two? Yeah. Right. And, you know, we see this in agriculture, too, you know, when you have you know, a slaughterhouse that is doing things, you know, not quite up to standard the wrong way, if you want to call it that. Um, again, it just gets everybody on edge and we just, we can't keep cutting these corners and we can't sacrifice the environment for economics. And we can't just push something through because we need to make money and not take care of the environment. And really, they, the entire industry needs to work together to ensure that happens. We've unpacked a lot today. Uh, we've learned about the current narrative of sustainable seafood that tends to be a very narrow view and the need to really kind of expand that lens from those local impacts to ecosystems like bycatch, overfishing, escapes, and really kind of extending that out to understand seafood's role in terms of the bigger food system, in terms of what it provides humans and as nutritional value, um, but also as a potential tool to help address climate change. So, this is a lot of really complex information that you guys have given us. So I'm gonna ask you, what is the one key takeaway for our audience, someone who cares about sustainable seafood? If they walk away with just one key takeaway from this discussion, what is it that you want them to walk away with? And Peter, we're gonna start with you on this one. Um, there's a lot of great seafood choice out there from fisheries and aquaculture. Don't be afraid to try new things, new species, new product forms, and um, always be open to learning new things as uh, products, uh, as new information becomes available. And, you know, if it means that you have to refine your understanding, that's okay. And Robert, how about you? If, if the audience takes away just one key message from this discussion, what is it that you want them to walk away with? I guess my overall point is this. Uh, aquaculture can be part of a solution for a sustainable food system and creating a healthy ocean, but we have to get it right. If we don't get it right, we'll exacerbate the problems that our ocean are already, is already facing. And I think the other important thing to understand is we're just at the beginning of this growth trajectory for aquaculture. Uh, right now is the time for us to act to define what we want this uh, aquaculture industry to look like. And Michael, you get the last word. If the audience takes right. away, <laughs> we're ready for your mic drop moment. If the audience, <laughs> no pressure. If the audience takes away just one key message from this uh, very important discussion, what would you want that to be? Yeah, you know, <laughs> thinking about seafood as a, a food system, we have impacts because we eat food. There's just, you can't get around it. And food is, it's a portfolio. We don't eat a single item, we eat multiple items. So as Peter said, eat a diversity of things, um, eat small portions, and just remember that do better today than you did yesterday, do better tomorrow than you're doing today. To those of you tuning in, thank you so much for joining us. Go to aquariumofpacific.org for a full listing of panels in the series, and we look forward to seeing you for each and every one of them. In the meantime, go vote and reward yourself with some good seafood. Bye.